Anton has a short story called The Lament. It's a simple story about an old man who drives a horse and a buggy for hire throughout the city. The story goes that the old man's son died recently, and he wants so desperately to tell someone, to, to share in his grief. So at first, a wealthy man hires the horse and buggy for a ride across the town. And as the wealthy man steps into the carriage, the old man says, My son, my son, let me tell you about my son. But the wealthy man is too busy and doesn't have time to listen. Well, after the wealthy man leaves, another man steps in the carriage. He wants to be driven to the other side of the city. And again, the old man says, my son, my son, let me tell you about my son. And again, the second man is too busy or uninterested and doesn't listen to the old man. Rider after rider refuses to listen to the old man and about his son. At the end of the day, the old man returns to the stables, unhitches the horses, gets them ready for the night, and the old man begins to talk to the horse. My son, my son, let me tell you about my son. You see, the old man was searching for comfort. He was searching for comfort in his grief and his distress. This parable is about the, insufficiency, the insufficient comfort we get in this world that we find in people and things. The brokenness and the grief that we have and the comfort we need. The truth is this world is filled with evil and sin inside and outside of us. We are all impacted by this evil and death and sin from all directions in all moments in our life. And that's not to diminish the goodness and the beauty and the joy that can be found in this world. But when properly understood, we all experience anxiety, pain, hardships, grief, and the brutality of this world. And we all seek comfort. We all need comfort. Where do you find your comfort? Where do you seek your comfort? Perhaps you find it, uh, it's interesting enough, like uh, infants, right? We train them to comfort themselves. We give them blankets and pacifiers so they can soothe themselves. It's an innate who we are that we need to be comforted. Perhaps you find a comfort in a, in a book curled up by a fire with hot cocoa or coffee, your choice. Perhaps you find comfort in good and hearty food, right? We have a word for that, comfort, food. Perhaps you find your comfort in drinks, spirits. Perhaps you find your comfort in, in knowledge and in information. I know I am uncomfortable when I don't have it. Perhaps you find your comfort in health or money. Perhaps you find your comfort in power, secure borders, powerful military, locks on your doors, alarms on your cars and house. Perhaps you find comfort in friends and people. Lots of ways that we find our comforts. Perhaps we you find your comfort in physical intimacy. None of these things that I mention are bad things. None of them are bad in and of themselves, but none of them provide lasting comfort. All of them give an illusion of comfort. All of them just give temporary ease of our anxiety and fears. Where do you find your comfort? Let's go back to the beginning of Nahum. I know we're at the end, and I'm going to the, end, the beginning. We're going to start it all over again for another 12 weeks. No. <laughs> Let's go back to Nahum 1.1. An oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of vision of Nahum, of Elkosh. Remember that Nahum's name means comfort. And Elkosh means severe. 
So this book, we're told at the very beginning, is a book about severe comfort. Which this is a weird way of talking about things. But then we have read this book and like, yeah, I kind of get what God is talking about. That this comfort that he provides is severe in this world. My hope is that throughout this, this book, uh, we've learned about God's vengeance and justice, and you have seen how it's highlighted, and it points to the gospel message that God is our hope and comfort in all things. However, it's easy to get lost and distracted by the harsh and brutality of the world around us, so it is to get, easy to get distracted by the harsh and brutality language in Nahum. But the central theme in all of life And in this book is God is our comfort. God is our refuge. Reside in him. Flee to him. In all your troubles, in all your distress, rely on him alone. And then it goes further in chapter 1, Nahum 1, uh, 1, 7 through 8. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make a complete end of the adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. And so there you have it in this one verse, this contrast. And both lines are lines of comfort. That God is the comfort. And his comfort resides that he is a God of justice. And his justice is complete and perfect. So far, this series that we end today in reaching the Ninevites, in a series going through Jonah and Nahum, I hope you remember, I told you the very beginning, to think of yourself as the Ninevites. And in Nahum, we have learned that God's vengeance is against those who draw his beloved, you and I's affections away from him. That God's a jealous God, that he fights for the affections of his beloved spouse. And we know that God loves us when he disciplines us. He afflicts us. We've learned to trust Jesus and his ways, his kingdom methods. And we learned a little bit about humility, his ways, and and fasting. Any of you fast last night or yesterday? Or, Or prayer and scripture. And we learned that God will pull the great switcheroo on the fortunes of this world and will establish his eternal kingdom. We're learning that we are under shepherds, that we are to encourage and exhort each other. The importance of being in relationship and actually knowing each other. And that God proclaims woe to us to silence us, to silence our sins and to turn our hearts to repentance. And that you and I, by the very nature that we are in sin, we sell ourselves and others into slavery of sin. But Jesus redeems us. And that God publicly exposes all sin. And that today, today we learn God is our only true comfort. In this world of trouble and distress and anxiety, God is our comfort and we find refuge in him. You see, the Assyrians, uh, the Ninevites trusted in their wealth, their position and power. That doesn't sound like any of us, does it? They took comfort in their own ability to provide, to rule, to protect. Why? Because they were unchallenged for 150 years. They ruled and pillaged everyone around them, and no one was a threat until, until God. It's easy to find our comfort in our own ability and in righteousness when it goes unchallenged. That's why we probably get defensive when it is challenged. And here's the thing. You know it. This life will bring you discomfort. This life will teach you that you can't rely on yourself. That you can't comfort yourself. You can't comfort yourself in the grief and evil of this world. This is the lesson that God is and will teach us over and over again again. And this is the lesson that he taught the Assyrians and the Ninevites. And we come to the end. In Nahum 3.13, 
He says, Behold, your troops are women in your midst. The gates of your land are wide open to the enemies. Fire has devoured your bars. Over and over, I, I apologize to the women in this passage, but this is the language culturally here. What this, he says, the Assyrians thought, thought they were the mightiest of armies that outnumbered everyone. And God says, in comparison to me, your army is filled with women. Culturally understand this. Women were not in the military. Why were the women not in the military at that time? Because the idea that you had to increase and have children over all the time, women had to be doing that. That was really important for them. So to have women in that capacity to be in military, like, what are you talking about? Pregnant women walking around and fighting? This is crazy. Although, um, sometimes, right, I don't know, have you ever engaged a pregnant woman? Yeah, right? <laughs> You got to be careful with that, right? But that's the idea is like, you are nothing in compared to God. Here God says, your troops are worthless. They're incompetent. Their strength is nothing. What you think is a strength, what you think is a strength in this world versus God is actually a weakness. And so all of us, like, we rely, we, we rely on our strength so much. Like, this is my strength. I'm going to rely on that. And God say, well, you think that is a strength. It actually is nothing in comparison to God. The troops are no match against God. Nahum 3, 15 through 17. There will, then there will the fire devour you. The sword will cut you off. It will devour you like locusts. Multiply yourselves like the locusts. Multiply like the grasshopper. You increase your merchants more than the stars of the heavens. The locust spreads its wings and flies away. Your princes are like grasshoppers. Your scribes are like clouds of locusts settling on the fences in a day of cold. When the sun rises, they fly away, and no one knows where they are. The idea that the Nineveh, Nineveh and the Assyrians are so numerous, they are like a plague of locusts. But ultimately, locusts are no match to the wildfire. They can't flee it. It overtakes them. Also, they are like locusts and grasses, so vast in their economic power, it says, that their ner ner merchants have increased and overwhelmed. And the reality is that Nineveh only provides the walls for the merchants where the locusts sit on. But here's the thing. When the merchants are done selling their wares, consuming, they leave. And there is no benefit to the Assyrians. It's the idea, this is, the, this is kind of the idea that of, hear carefully, capitalism, unrestricted, by its very nature, consumes and devours. And that's the imagery in which it's given here. Is that you think your, your economic strength and power is good for you, but in the end, it just devours and consumes Everyone around you, including yourself. There is no security or comfort in your military power because it is no match. There is no security or comfort in your economic power because it is match. It will all vanish and fly away like the locusts. And then it goes on in 18, 19. Your shepherds are asleep, O king of Assyria. Your nobles slumber. The people are scattered on the mountains with none to gather them. There is no easing your hurt. Your wound is grievous. It's fatal. All who hear the news about you clap their hands over you. For upon you, whom has not come your unceasing evil. The kings and shepherds of Nineveh are asleep. They are resting in their own comfort in the comfort of their wealth their power and their position and this book ends with this rhetorical question it says look at your wound is fatal and everyone is applauding your death everyone is excited because it has this rhetorical line because whom have you not sinned against who have you not armed who has not you brought evil against and that's the last word that God says, I am bringing justice, and everyone is glad. As we're told in the beginning, this comfort in ourselves is foolish. Opposition to God 
is foolish. Nahum 1, 8 through 9, but with the overwhelming flood, he will make a complete end of his adversaries and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Why do you plot against the Lord? He will make complete end. Trouble will not rise up a second guy. It makes no sense to oppose God. Even the Assyrians couldn't oppose God. God, our comfort in God is part because God's justice against evil is complete and perfect. This all good, all knowing, all powerful God of the universe brings judgment and justice to all, against all evil, against all discomfort in the world. And we find our comfort in the God that does that, that is righteous. That righteous word means that is just, that he brings an end to the reign of Nineveh. And that's the point of this book. Where do you find your comfort? Because only in God is our comfort. All other temporary and, and worldly comforts, although they may good, they are not comfort. Look, look at, there, are, there, are, there are healthy ways to cope, right? And there's lots of coping. Like you, you can ground yourself. You ever heard the ground of yourself? Right? Put your feet on the ground and, and breathe. Right? Those are good comfort zones to exercise. Those are good ways to, to comfort yourself. Slow breathing. But all those methods, all of those methods, why are healthy than some of the other ones that I mentioned? Healthier? They are temporary. They do not provide lasting comfort. The only comfort in this world is trusting in God. And that seems really weird, doesn't it? Because you and I, we struggle to trust God. If it's the only thing that we ought to be comforted in, that God is the one that brings justice, that God is love. And yet we struggle with this but it's the only everlasting comfort. All the other ones that we're over-dependent on will fail us. Proverbs 21, 30, no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. Psalm 33, 16, 17, the king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might, it cannot rescue. Might we add in, you and I, our comforts, are the way that we find comfort, the way that we cope. Do not comfort us, and do not help us cope with sin, with evil. In everlasting ways. Uh, you think about that Psalm 33. I, I just think about it as a, in a Christian perspective. That our strength and power are not means in which we will ever find comfort or refuge. So why would we ever have a position where we hold on to those things that might give us that kind of strength. That kind of power and strength. We, we seek after those things but they provide no comfort. They're meaningless. Only the eternal God can bring eternal and everlasting comfort. Let's remember a little bit. Going back to Jonah, 150 years before Nahum, God sent Jonah, the disgruntled prophet, to preach to the Ninevites. The Ninevites in that book, remember, they repented. They turned from their ways, their gods, their strengths, and they followed God and his ways. They did it on a five-word sermon. And God turned the whole thing around. God reached out to them in mercy, and they repented. They trusted in God for their comfort, and not in themselves, not in their gods, and not in their means. But soon thereafter... They turned again. They trusted in their might and the blessings that God gave them and their gods and their means and their strength. And 
and then Nahum, God gives them the message. God promises vengeance and judgment, not just for turning their back again, but turning their back and relying on their own means in which they use for brutality and evil against others. I just want you to understand, like the story of, of repentance, uh, unrepentance, and God's been, look, it, it requires us every day to be faithful to God. You cannot rely on like, hey, I was faithful yesterday. Or my parents were faithful. Or my grandparents were faithful. Or this generation before in this church were faithful. It requires you and I every day to rely on the strength of God to be faithful faithful and to trust and to repent and to turn to him every day when you wake up our job is to repent of our ways and not to rely on our strengths but to to trust in him and his ways period and in only in that cycle do we find our comfort and our means to cope in this world i'm not saying like i'm not saying you, you find that oh your days will be better i'm not saying that The circumstances still might be terrible because sin is pervasive in this world. It's pervasive in your heart. But this is the means. But in the midst of this, that God promises vengeance, that God promises them vengeance and brings justice to the the, the Ninevites, this is what God still has a promise and hope for them. This is, this is not the last word for the Ninevites. Isaiah 19, hear this promise. This is a crazy promise. 23 to 25. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Remember, Egypt is to the south of Israel. Assyrians are to the north. And Assyria will come to Egypt, and Egypt into Assyria. And the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day... Israel will be with the third, with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the works of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. What? Did you hear that? In the midst of all that, God is saying, Look at it. It's a symbol of the Egyptian, the north, the south, everyone. Even those that are outside traditionally of God's people, Israel, they will all come. They will all be my people. They will all worship me. I will bring them back. Remember, it's it's the promise that God gives to Abraham that his seed will be a blessing to all nations, to all people groups. And Jesus is that gift, is that seed of Abraham. It's not just to the the blood descendants of Abraham. It's to all the people groups. Even those who are bitter enemies of God will be redeemed. Because here's what we know. You and all, all start as bitter enemies to God until he turns your heart. Until he does a work. This isn't universalism. This isn't saying all Individual people will be saved. It is what's saying is that the gospel message is inclusive to all people groups. Everyone gets to be included and invited into God's kingdom. It's just not a select group. Because it's about faith and trust in God, not blood. Hear this very clear. You are not saved because you are born in the line of Abraham. You are not saved because you are born into the church of God. You are saved by the work of God alone. Period. Isaiah 45, 22, 23 says, God says, turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am the God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, f- sworn for my mouth has gone out in righteousness, a word that shall not return 
to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. When he says, my, my word will not return, like it, it, it can't be re, re, um, repealed. It's spoken, and this is true. This will happen. Everyone will come and understand to worship the Lord of God. There is only one God. This is the gospel message. He says to them, turn to me and repent. This is what he gives to Nineveh. This is what he gives to Egypt. This is what he gives to Israel, to Judah, to the people in China, to the people in Russia and to North Korea, to everywhere, to the ends of the earth, to everyone in the United States, in your neighborhood, to you. This is the message he gives. Turn to me. He alone is our refuge. He alone is the only comfort in this world. And the New Testament makes it very clear. Paul points to this passage about turning to him. And he points it to Jesus. Philippians 2.10. He also does this in Romans 14. But in Philippians 2.10 it says, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. So you see what he was talking about in Isaiah 45. He says, turn to me. So he says, turn to Jesus. That's me. God is saying, that's me. And Paul and the New Testament are just making it very clear that Jesus is the one God. There is no other God. And there is no other comfort outside of him. There is no other comfort or justice or love outside of the cross. It has to be dealt with. We will all deal with it. The gospel is clear. Trust in Jesus. It's the same gospel that's in Isaiah. It's the same gospel that's in Nahum. It's the same gospel that's in Genesis. It's in the same gospel in every book of this Bible. Trust in Jesus. Turn to him. He is your only comfort. So where do you find your comfort? If we're honest, where do you seek it? We try in so many places because our physical bodies, our soul, our minds are telling us we need comfort. I need comfort. This world is anxious. Nahum is telling us don't trust in yourself or the things of this world. They will not provide the eternal comfort. Find your comfort Find your peace that makes no sense in God and God alone. And just as Chekhov had the story about the old man seeking comfort from the grease of his lost son with anybody and anyone because he needed comfort. And we're like that old man. We need comfort day in and day out and we'll seek it from anyone or anything. And God is saying to him, hear it clearly, Turn to me. I will listen. I will comfort. Psalm 55, 16 to 17. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan. And he hears my voice. And he hears my voice. You see, when we turn to God and we tell him our discomfort and we lament and we complain and we do whatever it is, our struggles, he will hear. He is listening. He is present. I, I mean, I think we go along and we, because we don't see him or don't hear him or can't manifest, like, we, we like, he's not present and so he's not listening. I don't see any action. Do those other things give you action? Listen. Turn to God. In all the brokenness that you have, in all the grief in this world, turn to him. Look, the ordinary means in which you can turn to him is with God's people and in his word. Use us. Use each other. Help each other turn to God. I want to end with Psalm 46, and let that be our prayer. I'm going to read it and then pray. 
Because Psalm 46, it's a familiar uh, psalm to us, a psalm of comfort. But usually we just remember the last two verses, right? Be still and know that I'm God. Oh, yes. But you've got to read the other parts. Why ought to we be still? Why ought we to find our comfort in God? Let's read Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength. No, oh, that's awesome that you were reading that with me. <laughs> I was actually going to read it, and I'm going to pray. But let's do it again. We're going to read it, then I'll stop and pray. So we're just going to read the first verse. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Lord, Lord, you know that we need a place to hide, a place of comfort in this world, a place of protection, a shield about us from the harm and the grief and the brokenness in this world and from our own hearts. We know that you are present. Lord, help us in this. Give us your strength. Let's read verse 2 and 3. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its wateries roar and foam, Though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Gracious Lord. Gracious Lord. It's so easy for us to fear. As, as the conditions in our life shake us to the core. And the waves keep battering us down and harming us. We know that you are present. And you are in that midst with us. Lord, we ask for you to rescue us and turn our hearts and our eyes and our ears towards you. Let's read verses 4 through 5. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when her morning dawns. Lord, we pray for the establishment of your kingdom Lord, help us to see it in our presence with, with the body of Christ and all these local churches and in our community and the church universal. Help us to know that you are present and working in this world at every corner of this earth. And that we are not alone because you are present because there's other parts of the body of Christ present. And when we feel alone, Lord, open our eyes so we know that we're not. Open our hearts so we know that we're not. Bring us this comfort. Let's read verses 6 through 9. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Lord, I am so glad that you are a God that brings complete justice and vengeance. That you let no sin be undealt with, whether at the cross or at the day of judgment. Lord, help us to see, help us to see your works in the midst of all of that. And that when our knees tremble and, we, uh, and this, these kingdoms battle each other and things fall apart, that we remember that the Lord of all power is with us. And he is our fortress. And you are our fortress, our protector. Let's read verses 10 through 11. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Gracious and good God. May our hearts be still. May we know that you are the one true God. May we know that you are good and just and righteous, and all-powerful. That every knee will bow, 
and every tongue will confess. Lord, grant us the hearts to believe, to trust, and the mouths to confess and turn to you to exalt your name. Help us to be still. Help us to slow down in the midst of all the brokenness, in the midst of all the grief, and remember what you have done. See what you are doing and trust in the promises of what will be done. You are with us forever and ever. Amen. Fellow Ninevites, turn to God. Find your comfort in him alone.